Henry Kaminsky. I'm the professor at George Washington University in Washington, D.C. And I and my colleagues at GW recently published a review article in the Journal of Clinical Investigation and entitled The, the Future is Now for Myasthenia Gravis. And, and that actually is an update on an article from 2006, which you know, kind of set the stage of, of what was going on in myasthenia and tried to predict what was going to be happening in the, in the future. And so some of the things we got correct, some of the things we didn't, but um, in terms of the future is now title, um, yeah, I'll, I'll tell you why I, I said that. First of all, there's just been tremendous explosion of knowledge and techniques to study the immune system. And by that means single cell genomic approaches, metabolomics, proteomic pictures using, uh, you know, even in rare disease, pretty small data sets, but a lot of information is coming out of that. There was a recent paper from a German group that utilized proteomics of, um, it was a little over 100 patients with myasthenia. The, the cool thing that that was derived from that is that they found certain groups just from their patient protein evaluations in their serum that could be divided into four groups. They looked into this a little deeper, and then they found a treatment-resistant group that was predicted from the proteins. And then they dove deeper into that, and those patients appear to be the ones that are generating a lot of complement um, products in their their blood, so their complement system is very active. Well, the cool thing about that is we now have complement inhibitor treatments. And so the thought is maybe we can now prospectively identify patients who would really benefit from this class of drugs. So the, the, the cool thing in the future being now is we can um, really do deep characterization of the biology of myasthenia gravis and then link it immediately to clinical characteristics, which allow us to drive a specific therapeutic towards the patient. So that's the best case scenario. Is, is that what's going on in 2024? Not exactly, but you can certainly envision that over the next few years, that we're going to be able to develop techniques to specifically uh, target treatment groups and patients that, that we, you know, we never envisioned before. And just going along the, the topic of finding um, new ways to characterize patients, and this is just starting to develop in neuromuscular diseases using technology to monitor patients. So you heard about digital um, biomarkers. So right now, our clinical tools to say patient is better, patient is not, is very dependent on questionnaire to the patients, the myasthenia gravis activities of daily living. And scientists, clinicians, visit patients all say, this is really not reflecting the true patient experience. But that is what the FDA uses to approve drugs. So the hope is that we can use monitoring systems. And so I'll give you an example from Duchenne's muscular dystrophy, which is now an FDA approved uh, digital biomarker for clinical trial use. It's basically a, a system that goes on the ankle of a patient and it continuously monitors their walking, their the speed of their walking. And over several studies, they've been able to identify that this is a much much better way to track the severity of the disease and how potentially a treatment could be uh, monitored in this way, reducing the noise of the kind of clinical outcome measures we have now and reduce the number of patients you need in a clinical trial because now you don't have this you know, as much variation in your clinical outcome measure. So that's that, that's like an ideal situation. And in myasthenia, there's several groups, including the ones at, at GW that, that I'm working with, that are trying to quantitate the neuromuscular examination 
in a much better fashion so that we can do clinical outcome measures over video via telemedicine. So clinical, uh, you know, subjects in clinical trials don't need to come in for a visit, which takes two hours for somebody to come into the middle of Washington and then sp spend another two hours in our um, study center and then go back home for two hours. They can actually do potentially a digital evaluation over you know, the appropriate secure video telemedicine system and actually have a better measure of how they're doing and a be better examination. There's apps being developed that a patient can enter their, um, their clinical status and mon be monitored more carefully. Um, and all that is just gonna continue to grow and, and develop. And so there's great things going on the basic biology side. There's great things going on the clinical side. And then we have just a boatload of new FDA approved uh, treatments. So I mentioned complement inhibitors. They started in 2016. Now we have three that are approved. One that can be just self-injected on a daily basis instead of being infused um, every eight weeks or every other week. We have um, what are called FCRN inhibitors, which when they were first approved were the first class of medication uh, for any human disease. Now that's expanded out to another neuromuscular disease, but they rapidly um, decrease the autoantibody levels in patients. And you know that's how they work. The one deficiency in our present treatments, of which there are actually several, I don't want to imply there's only one, is that we don't have a, a way to eliminate the antibody producing cells in a specific rapid safe way. So right now everything we have is um, used you know, broadly to suppress the immune system, but the hope, and again, there's, there's um, groups across the world that are trying to find a way to target specifically those antibody producing cells. And the way that's been um, achieved is now we have the, technologies that can um, identify those specific antigen producing cells and safely, hopefully, destroy them and then allow the immune system to just uh, continue its normal functioning after we've eliminated those antibody producing cells. So it's, it's just, you know, just a great deal of excitement about what the coming years will, will see in, in myasthenia. For the complement inhibitors, they were the first um, disease that was targeted was paroxysmal nocturnal hemoglobin area. So that's like 50,000 people in the entire, or 20,000 people in the entire world where their red blood cells are particularly susceptible to complement mediated injury. And, you know, what's really amazing, you know, that's an awful disease that patients um, require blood transfusions on a monthly basis because their red blood cells are being destroyed. And because their red blood cells are being destroyed, there's a lot of hemoglobin in their blood, which damages their kidneys. And you look at the New England Journal of Medicine with this eculizumab molecule as a treatment, you see the number of transfusions over the baseline period. You see the treatment started and the transfusions just stop. Hmm. I mean, it's unbelievably effective. But going to what you're saying there, there was a good amount of knowledge that the complement system is very important in um, being activated to produce injury to the neuromuscular junction. So choosing myasthenia gravis as a, uh, a disease that would likely be responsive to complement inhibitors was a very logical and reasonable one at the time. So our laboratory actually tested an anti-C5 molecule and, and you know, preclinical you know, animal work showed dramatic improvement. So um, you know, there was also the kind of basic biology that demonstrated that these should work. And they have. They're, they can be remarkable. The FCRN inhibitors, you know, I can't say why 
the specific drug companies decided on myasthenia gravis, other than the fact that, to your point, it was pretty well understood. You have plasma exchange, which basically is a kind of dialysis system that removes antibodies from the bloodstream. And so patients with myasthenic crisis or severe uh, weakness would improve significantly and rapidly with plasma exchange. And then you have this FCRN inhibitor drug where you expect it to drop antibody levels, and they do, not specifically, very rapidly. You would expect that to work in myasthenia gravis. So, and the, the, the phase, you know, three trials have demonstrated that, and the follow-up has demonstrated that, and the clinical you know, just the clinical experience is growing. And so we we see those are beneficial. I do I do want to just throw in some caveats about complement and uh, FCRN inhibitors. There is no question they are great to have in the um, armamentarian of, of treating myasthenia gravis. Not everybody responds. Not everybody responds dramatically. And um, you know, that's seen in the clinical trials as well. And it's also appreciated in common clinical practice. You know, if you, the, the, for an insurance company to continue pay for these, um, there has to be demonstrable improvement in a patient, um, which I think is a reasonable thing. You don't want to give somebody something that's not working, right? So then the, the question becomes kind of, Back to what I said, it'd be great if we had a, a, a easy assay to say this is going to work for this, you know, this complement inhibitor is going to work for this patient. Um, and if not, then let's try something else. And then again, they're just treating the final step that impairs neuromuscular junction function. They're not eliminating the, the autoantibodies that, that produce those cells. So great addition not a cure and, and not the, the, the solution, and they are very expensive. The study I mentioned, it's not the end, it's the beginning. It, it showed a signal for this and a pathway to look at to identify these really treatment unresponsive patients in a fashion that you could logically treat them in a certain way. Um, and there's other groups doing that. They're trying to develop assays that determine the complement, degree of complement activation for antibodies. Um, and then just along those lines, it, as we've learned more about this, it has become more complicated because we thought, okay, well, you have an acetylcholine receptor antibody, it binds the acetylcholine receptor, it activates complement, and um, there you have it. But it appears that you really have to have multiple different kinds of antibodies that are binding the receptors on the surface and then forming this uh, complex of complement inhibitory or complement um, proteins on the, the surface of the, the muscle. You disrupt these things in a certain way, then you're not going to get complement activation. And then you, you put a certain set of antibodies together. It may activate complement or it may cause what's uh, referred to as antigenic modulation, where the muscle takes the antibody complex off the, um, the, surface, of the mullet, uh, surface of the muscle, and then that's how it impairs nerve muscle communication. And so if really most of the antibodies are causing antigenic modulation, doesn't matter if you're putting complement inhibitors into the system and because that's not the way they're all activating, even though they're all acetylcholine receptor um, antibodies. And then, oh, by the way, some of these antibodies don't cause disease. And so maybe they're actually disrupting this complex that could cause disease. So sometimes there's good acetylcholine receptor antibodies. So I would say, you know, what I, I just describe, you know, the level of complexity as we understand things has just increased significantly. <laughs> well, I'll tell you, I think what I would like to add is a uh, discussion of a um, New England Journal of Medicine paper that came out back in August. And 
that um, study suggested that removal of the thymus is deleterious to just patients writ large with the idea, okay, you're removing an active immune organ and you're putting patients at risk for autoimmune diseases and cancers. And that has led to a lot of concern for patients with myasthenia, should they have a thymectomy despite the phase three New England Journal of Medicine paper that showed that it benefits patients. And then perhaps of even greater concern, patients with a thymoma, an actual tumor of the thymus, about questioning their surgeons about whether they should have the, the tumor removed. So I and a group of colleagues from across the US and, and in, into Europe published a, um, essentially a rebuttal to that study and pointed out as multiple um, flaws. But again, most importantly, it's, it's caused a response from patients that have questioned what is clearly a highly reliable treatment.